Good morning. Oh, grace and peace to you in the name of the risen Christ, and welcome as we gather here on this Sunday. It's good to see all of you here, and let's just keep praying the sunshine comes. I, I, I enjoy these beautiful autumn days, and I hope you do too. Welcome as we gather here, and uh, again, uh, God's peace be with you all. Please be sure to find the ritual of friendship found at the uh, end of each of those pews, and again, remember to sign in and greet those around you this morning, and following worship, we'll join with each other down around the refreshment tables uh, downstairs. As we gather, please be mindful of the announcements that you see here. Uh, just, just imagine Holiday Fair is actually almost on our doorstep, and you still have some news here about all the um, uh, various rooms that will be there uh, on that day, uh, coming up on that November 4th, uh, I know uh, noodles have been made, tea rings are being made, lots of preparations, so again, I hope all of you will just spread the news around this community, that this is the place to be on that first uh, Saturday of November. Um, as you look, continue to look through the bulletin again next Sunday, um, I invite you uh, to remember that the Boy Scouts of our church are going to be serving a spaghetti dinner starting at 1130, and that's one of their fundraisers for the year, and I hope, uh, hope you'll consider coming back and again joining, enjoying the fellowship of one another. Uh, and again, be mindful of everything else that you uh, uh, read about here. This uh, is our fourth week of our uh, stewardship commitment uh, campaign. Uh, and you have your last uh, insert here before you. And I hope you all in the month of October have been counting your blessings and also thinking of the ways that God really is at work in your lives. And, uh, you know, I, I, hope, I hope we are talking about, about how God, God is clearly revealed uh, in and through us and around us and uh, reminding us to, to be a generous people. So uh, uh, those of you who are members and uh, friends of the church, I believe a letter and a card is in the mail to you next Sunday. Uh, we invite you to bring that estimate of giving card back to church here with you, and we'll have a moment of dedicating them in our worship service. Next Sunday is also our in-gathering kits Sunday, and if you've been busy working with uh, either at home or with others on uh, kits for missions, uh, remember to bring those with you next Sunday. And uh, if you still need like a reminder of what goes in a kit, there is a, a wonderful little um, uh, display out by the Welcome Center. So, uh, so please stop and, and take a look there. Uh, yesterday, again, I had the joy of celebrating a wedding in this sanctuary, the wedding of Kelly, Kaylee, Col <laughs> Kaylee Colbert and Andrew Hardy, two uh, wonderful young kids. Uh, Kaylee and Andrew have been worshiping with us over the last year, and uh, it was just another joyful experience. I think that's the last wedding I officiate this year. So, uh, and we've had several uh, here in the sanctuary. And, and I just mentioned that to, to again, mention, m mention love in our midst, and that uh, in this sanctuary, there, there's a lot of love here for everybody. Uh, with, with that being said, l let us, out of our, our love for Christ and our, our love for each other, let's stand and welcome each other more fully into the presence of this day. Ah, oh. ah, oh. good. And uh, let us remain standing as uh, Pastor Cephas calls us into worship this day. Let us celebrate the God of all creation. Our God is great. Let us praise God's great and awesome name. God is holy. Our God is a lover of justice. Let us praise God's justice and righteousness. God is holy. Our God is the leader of the people. Let us worship and praise the Lord, for God is holy. Holy. 
Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing God's power, God's love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. O oh, tell of God's might, O oh, sing of God's grace. Whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, whose chariots of wrath the deep thunder clouds form, and dark is God's path on the wings of the storm. The earth with its store of wonders untold, Almighty thy power hath founded of old, hath established it fast by a changeless decree, and round it hath cast like the mantle the sea. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our Maker, Defender, Liver and friend. Now, people of faith, let us pray together. Holy, Holy and, and gracious God, God we, have, we been have been called, called together, together to do to your work, to be a church, church with purpose, purpose nurturing faith, faith comforting, comforting hearts, hearts, sharing, sharing our, our gifts, gifts for the good of all. all. Resisting the forces of evil to exploit and marginalize. Being fierce love facing the violence of the day. Defending human dignity. Being members of a community that is aided and inspired by God. Corrected and comforted by the loving spirit of Christ. As your instruments on earth. Come, Come and be, be with, with us, us as, as we, we worship, and help us to listen for your will and direction. Give, give us the strength to serve you with joy. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and let the children or come forward. Good morning. How are you today? Good. All right. Um, do you know what a pledge is? Have you ever heard that word? You probably have heard it recently in church, right? A pledge. What does pledge mean? How about if I give you a word kind of like it? Promise. A promise. Excellent. Promise. What is a promise? Leah. Yeah, you, you swear you're going to do it, and you're not allowed to break it. That's right. So we have been um, in this process called stewardship campaign, and it's where we, as adults, we get these cards, and most of us got them in the mail, and they're called our pledge cards. And it's, we write down how much money we promise to give to the church 
next year for 2018, okay? So we're, we're making a promise to give. Now, did you know that you can make a promise to give? Do you think that it has to be money, though? Not necessarily. You can, though. Do any of you do any work at home, maybe and make an allowance? Do you, do you make a little allowance? Yeah. Maybe make a, a, a quarter for unloading the dishwasher or something like that, maybe? Yeah, you'd get pretty rich in our house if you did that, right? Yeah. So, so you can make a promise to give. You can make a promise to give money, but you can make a promise to give in other ways. What do you think are ways that you could give to God? What are things you could give to God? Hmm. How about things you could do? Yeah, Leo. Love others. Excellent. Love others. You can make a promise to love others. You could make a promise to maybe sit or play with somebody who seems alone at school. Leah, what else? Mm hmm. That's great. You have a buddy bench at school. If somebody's sitting there, you know that that means they're alone and they want somebody to play with. So you could go over, you could play with them. That's making a promise to God to be kind to others and to do kind acts. You know, there's something else that you can do. Did you know that you could pray? Did you know that? I knew that. I knew each one of you can pray. You can pray to God. You can pray to God for the church. You can pray for the pastors. You can pray for our other leaders in this church, too. You can make a promise to come to Sunday school. You can make a promise to come to our Wednesday night activities. And you can pray for all the other teachers and volunteers that we have here, too. Yeah, there's all sorts of things that you can make a promise to do. And you're not the only ones who are going to get a pledge card this year. Or the, the adults aren't the only ones. You get them, too. So I made these pledge cards out for you, so everybody gets one. There you go. And there's a spot on there where you get to mark off different things that you make a promise to do. And then there's also a spot if you want to give money, you can make marks on there. And then I will turn these in, just like the grown-ups pledge cards get turned into our business office, I will turn these into the business office. And you will get information about Every month, if you choose to give money, how much money that you've given each month. And you'll have your own giving statement every month. Would you like to get mail? Do you like to get things in the mail? Wouldn't that be kind of cool to get something in the mail from the church that says that you gave this much every month? That's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah, and then you could say, yep, I did it. I'm making my promise, and I'm not breaking it. And that would be awesome. And then there's space at the bottom. If you think of something else that you want to promise to do for the church, you can do that right there too, okay? All right. So let's pray together. Dear God. Dear God. Help us to do kind acts. Help us to do kind acts. And live in a loving way. And live in a loving way. Each and every day. Each and every day. Help us to pray and think about our promise. Help us to pray and think about our promise that we are going to make to this church that we're going to make for this church and help us to not break that promise and help us not to break that promise. Amen. Amen. All right.
Oh, thank you, choir, and, and thank you for that, that plea of unity. May God make us one. As we gather here today, I want to be sure to call to mind our Up With Puppets group. They're traveling, and they are worshiping with the people in Monona, Iowa, way up in the northeastern part of this state. And we pray for them as they share God's good news of God's gracious love today. As we uh, gather, open our hearts, God, to the hearing of these scriptures. We are almost uh, through the journey with Moses. Here we find Moses saying to the Lord, Oh, look, you've been telling me, lead these people forward. But you haven't told me whom you will send with me. Yet you assured me, I, I know you by name and think highly of you. Now if you do think highly of me, show me your ways so that I may know you and so that you may really approve of me. Remember too that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, I'll go myself and I'll help you. Moses replied, if you won't go yourself, don't make us leave here because how will anyone know that we have your special approval both I and your people, unless you go with us. Only that distinguishes us, me and your people, from every other people on the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I'll do exactly what you've asked, because you have my special approval, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glorious presence. And the Lord said, I'll make all my goodness pass in front of you, and I'll proclaim before you the name, the Lord. I will be kind to whomever I wish to be kind, and I will have compassion to whomever I wish to be compassionate. But, the Lord said, you can't see my face, because no one can see me and live. The Lord said, here is a place near me where you will stand beside the rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I'll set you in a gap in the rock, and I'll cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I'll take away my hand, and you will see my back, but my face won't be visible. This is God's word for God's people. I invite you to turn to our new worship and song, Green Songbook, for this new hymn of the church reminding us that God's presence is with us in every step we take. Let us stand as we sing. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I'll learn to walk in your ways. And step by step you'll lead me. And I'll follow you all of my days. My God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step you lead me, and I'll follow you all of my days. Amen. The gospel, the good news according to Matthew. 
Then the Pharisees met together to find a way to trap Jesus. In his own words, they sent their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to him. Teacher, they said, we know that you are genuine and that you teach God's way as it really is. We know that you're not swayed by people's opinions because you don't show favoritism. So tell us, what do you think? Does the law allow people to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Knowing their evil motives, Jesus replied, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used to pay the tax. And they brought him a denarian. Whose image and inscription is this? Jesus asked. Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were astonished, and they departed. This is the gospel of the risen Christ. Praise be to Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Ever since I was a child, I would not usually follow baseball until I got time for the World Series, uh, which is soon to be here, Dodgers versus Astros. And, and, and I smiled when, when I was reading a story recently about baseball player Ted Williams. Some of you may remember Ted. He, he had the goal of being the best baseball hitter who ever lived. And to that end, he kept telling himself something that he learned very early on in his career, something that was told to him by another baseball player. And the advice was simple. Get a good pitch to hit. That's it. That's the secret. Don't, don't swing at bad pitches. Work the count. Work the pitcher. Fell off the tough ones. Get a good pitch and hit it. The story goes that, that one time, Ted Williams was absolutely furious at himself when he hit a home run. He muttered all the way as he made his way around the bases. And, and, and he didn't do that congratulatory, uh, you know, handshake with the next batter. No, no, nor did he really care about the cheers of the crowd. He was upset because the pitch he hit out of the park was not a strike. And he broke his discipline to swing at it. <laughs> I like that. That's having focus. Focus can take a person a very long ways. W Williams w was not necessarily a great person. He wasn't a good husband or a father. He wasn't necessarily loved by all the fans, but he was loved by the press and the media in Boston. And, and he really was a, a great hitter. Get a good pitch and hit it. Good, sound advice. And so, kind of follow me, because I'm going to now make a leap from that story to this morning's gospel story. In, in which we find the Pharisees amazed, astonished with Jesus. And uh, it's not necessarily because of what he does. The gospel story that we have before us now takes place uh, near the end. Um, it, it's a story told in Jesus' last week of, of earthly life. He's now in Jerusalem. The, the great Palm Sunday procession is behind him. And he's locked in another one of those ongoing controversies with those who fear his ministry and who are envious of the love that the, that the masses have for him. The Pharisees. The Pharisees especially want to get rid of him. And so they put Jesus through a whole series of difficult public questions. It's, it, it's like he's being a thrown fastball after fastball after fastball. And, and in today's lesson, the evilness of the Pharisees is quite transparent. 
They, they are out to trap Jesus any way they can. And, and, and they have now joined forces with, uh, with the Herodians, the, the friends of Herod. And if you remember from your Bible study, the Herodians were, were Jews who, who, be, who befriended their Roman occupiers. So they were in cahoots, cons- conspiracy, with, with those who were actually oppressing their people. And, and they try to throw Jesus off guard uh, with some soft questions at first. You can read those uh, in the verses before this passage. And then they ask him to give them a formal ruling on a matter of law. It's a hard one. Does the law allow people to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, now know that this isn't an either-or question. Does the law allow? Is it lawful? In, in good legal fashion, they're asking a question which they already know the answer. It, it, it's not in accord with religious law be, because payment of the tax carries with it the acknowledgement of the emperor's divinity. Confusing Caesar with God is heresy. The way these Pharisees have structured this question this inquisition, Jesus really only has two options, and, and, and both of them are, are, are not good at all. I mean, if Jesus says, yes, it, it's lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, then he's denying the authority of God and discrediting himself from the religious establishment and all of those faithful Jewish followers that, that are becoming his disciples. But if he answers, no, you should not pay Caesar's tax, then those Herodians who have been brought in for this inquisition, they'll go and they'll report Jesus to the Roman authorities and he'll be accused of treason and they'll execute him on the spot. So, so Jesus can either discredit himself or he can get himself killed. I mean, what a choice. But Jesus sees the trap immediately, and he says, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? The, the question posed by the Pharisees is not about religious or political principles. It's all about trying to get Jesus into trouble. So, so Jesus responds to their question with a question. Oh, Jesus is so good at that. As you read the Gospels, you find that, 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 that this is Jesus' mode of, of operation, to, to answer a question with a question. And he says, first of all, sh- show me the coin that is used to pay the tax. And, and it's a denarius. It, it represents a fair day's wage for the common laborer. And, and it was a Roman coin. And, and, and because it was a Roman coin, it was not suitable to use in the, in the Jewish temple as an offering. And th- that's why there were money changers in the temple. And oh, Jesus had just had a conflict with those money changers in the previous chapter. And, and by asking for a denarius, it reveals to everyone that, well, Jesus doesn't have one. And by producing one, his adversaries reveal that they do. And then Jesus innocently asks, whose image and inscription is on this coin? And and the Pharisees in their group, they they don't really see this question coming at them, and, and they quickly answer Caesar's. And then Jesus simply looks at them and says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, give to God what belongs to God. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant answer. Give Caesar back his picture, but give to God what belongs to God. Go ahead, give to Caesar his coin, 
but don't confuse Caesar with God. And what exactly belongs to God? Jesus growing up in the Jewish faith, singing the Psalter. Oh, Jesus quite clearly knows the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all people in it. Now, in case we we find ourselves doubting that that Jesus has something like this on mind, when he says this, then, 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 then remember that in just a few more verses, Jesus is going to summarize the entire law by saying that we are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength, and we're to love our neighbors as ourselves. Heart, soul, mind, strength. All belongs to God. What is left? Caesar. Give Caesar his coin, but love God with your whole being. Don't ever confuse Caesar with God. Don't let Caesar tell you who you are. Jesus answers the question, and he avoids a trap. Jesus took the pitcher's pitch, and he creamed it. The, the Pharisees have to regroup and try something else, and we know that they will. Now, now I know very often, uh, and I'm, I've done it myself, so so often we'll, we'll try to apply this scripture passage to the relationship between church and state, and, and it certainly can be preached that way. If so, when we do that, the message is typically not that religion should stay out of politics and, and give Caesar whatever Caesar wants, but, but the message is more like even as you pay taxes and participate in a political society, your first loyalty is always to God. And, and, and that's a very good way to possibly understand this passage. But let me put you at ease. We're not going to talk politics today. Thank God. Let's, let's make this a sanctuary today where we can get away from some of the craziness of this world around us. As I look at this passage, and, and when I take it in context with the Jesus that, that, that I know by reading the Gospels, I, 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 I think that this lesson goes way beyond human politics. I, I believe it is a lesson that causes us to seriously stop and to consider our priorities, our loyalties, our allegiances, and how to keep them straight. It, it's all about the allegiances, all about everything that's clamoring to get our attention. I mean, are you aware of everything outside these doors that try to get our attention? I mean, we're bombarded every, every time we turn around. It, 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 it just makes us crazy. It's something we deal with every day of our lives, all the competing claims and loyalties on us. I, I mean, I, I meet so many people whose lives are fragmented and, and disjointed. Because they're all trying to do a million things at one time. They're all trying to serve a, a multitude of masters. We must stop and breathe and take a moment to consider what comes first. What comes first? Is it our job? In America, we work harder than anybody else on the face of this earth. And we're proud of it, except for that deep undercurrent of resentment and anger, that sense of entitlement because of all our overworking. We work. We work as though our work could and can define us. We work as though our work tells us who we are, gives us identity, meaning, value, purpose, a sense of well-being and peace. We work as though we think our work can save us. But let me tell you, I think I told you before, I have not yet heard anybody on their deathbed say to me, I wish I had spent more time at work. 
I, I'm not, not hurt anybody on their deathbed, say to me. I just never managed to give enough of my soul to my employer. What about our families? Families are vital. They're important. Obviously, a family can be a wonderful place in which to give and to receive love. Families, families ideally are supposed to be laboratories of love. But I've noticed that when people center their lives on other people and places on those relationships, uh, the burden of providing all that we need as, as an organizing principle for life, that, that things can and do get out of whack. I mean, children... I've known children who have struggled all their lives trying to meet up to the expectations of their parents. And I've known parents who look in vain for their children for, 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 for heaps of appreciation to compensate them for their, for their sacrifices that they've had to make. Mutual disappointment among family members looking to one another to make them feel whole and loved. It just creates long-term job security for therapists. When, when we try to make our lives whole, when we try to save ourselves through our family relationships, we, we then cannot allow that other person to, to just be simply the beautiful human being God created them to be. Because we expect so much. What about other loyalties? What, what about all that other stuff out there that, that, that's trying to get our attention? That, that's saying that, that they ought to be the organizing focus and principle of our life. You know, colleges, universities, nationalism, civic clubs and organizations, baseball clubs, music clubs, whatever. There are a whole host of things seeking to get our full loyalty, and they're so willing to tell us who we are. And, and they all may be very, very good things, but they cannot carry the full weight of giving our lives meaning and purpose, value, worth. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Give to God the things that belong to God. Loving God is to be the number one organizing principle and focus of our lives from which all other good things and blessings flow. Giving, giving to God is one of the things that, that, that help us to keep it all straight. Not, not, not giving out of a sense of guilt or, 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 or giving in, in, the, in thinking that we're going to earn God's favor or, or giving that somehow if we give, then we can kind of control what God will do. But, but giving to God that acknowledges that our whole entire life is a gift Giving to God that acknowledges that the things that are God's include all that we have and all that we are and all that we ever hope to become. Giving to God, giving to God that acknowledges that we find our purpose, our meaning, our worth in loving and serving God. Making giving and living a life that is generous, has, that has been the, the, the campaign slogan for, for this year, that kind of giving allows our lives to become an ongoing reminder that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and the people in it, which would include you and me. In a world that is so crazy at times, in, in a world of, of so many conflicting causes and claims and competing loyalties. Oh, let us remember that we find our salvation. We find our wholeness. We find our meaning and joy 
in maintaining a focus on what matters most, giving to God whose nature is love and who receives our fullest allegiance and deepest devotion. Just like Ted Williams' notion to, to get a good pitch and then hit it, this is all not a difficult concept. It's just the work of a lifetime. Remember, there is joy in giving to God what is God's. There is a deep joy in serving. There is an incredible joy in loving God as God first loved us. So, my friends, again, here in, on a beautiful Harvest Sunday, renew, renew, refresh, revive your commitment to make God the first priority in your life and then leave this sanctuary to go into all this world to live out that commitment to allow the light of God that sparks and ignites in you to be seen by others so that others will know God and give glory. May God bless you. May God confirm your promises, your pledge, your commitment this day. Amen. Let us continue to thank and praise God in prayer. How good it is to sing of your goodness, for you have called us here to learn about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We come with many names, terms of endearment that we cherish, and labels that we seek to one day destroy. We remember Moses, shepherd, leader, prophet, who was your faithful friend and servant. As you revealed yourself to him, O oh God, show yourself to those in need of strength and encouragement. We remember how your everlasting love healed the self-esteem and rebuilt the self-worth of a people who were oppressed and stripped of their human rights and dignity. We remember that you continue to heal the brokenhearted and bind up the wounds of all who hurt. In the silence of our hearts, hear the prayers we bring to you for those in need of healing. Oh God, when we feel weighed down by our burdens, when we feel weary to the point of collapse, when we find ourselves in exile, help us remember your words to Moses. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Hush our weary souls, O God, and remind us once more of your everlasting love. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us. 
this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for And now let us continue to celebrate our faith as we remember the God who gives. Through our offerings today, may they go to reach the least, the lost, the lonely. Let these gifts be a sign of our thanks to God.
Let us pray together. O oh God, oh God, it is up, it is up to, to us to share your gospel. Your gospel. Using, Using all the resources, resources that you provide, provide. It, is it is up, up to us to learn our whole story, story as your as whole people. people. With, With these, these gifts, gifts, God, empower, empower us, us to do, to do your work, work of sharing, sharing the, gospel the gospel and welcoming, and welcoming all, all who seek, seek to share in your story. story. Amen. Amen. Who belongs to God? What belongs to God? What belongs to God? The church belongs to God, not us. What belongs to God? You, 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 me. The Bible says we should glorify God in our body because we were bought with a price. What belongs to God? The fullness of the earth and everything thereof belongs to God. And God has called you into partnership to be God's hands and God's feet. So as you go, people of First United Methodist Church, do not forget your call. For God has called you to be his hands and his feet. Creator, Savior, Comforter. Amen. Amen. Take my life and let it be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee Take my moments and my days Let them flow in ceaseless praise Take my hands, my life, and be At the impulse of Thy love Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful.